So we take about half an hour for the panelists to introduce themselves and then talk about uh, a couple of issues around uh, entrepreneurship. And then in about 30 minutes or so, we'll open it up for your questions. Um, the, the other sort of structural thing I thought would be useful is to break the, the prepared questions up into two parts. Uh, one that deals with starting a company. So it's you know, where do you get capital, what happens with talent, how do you deal with ideas. The, uh, and in each of those things to contrast um, what's happening in general in entrepreneurship with uh, what's happening in India, if there are contrasts to be made. Uh, and we have a panel right here that's, that's quite experienced on both sides. Um, and, and so it would be interesting to see what's happening on, on both sides of it. And then for the second 15 minutes, um, we'll spend time on scaling and on exit. Um, so how do you take a company and, and, and grow it? Um, so in my, in my research here, the one thing that I study is failure. Um, and so that's an interesting topic, because if I don't produce anything, as I haven't, um, I'm just <laughs> adding to my research. <laughs> um, but um, what's interesting to me about, about failure was I always assume that companies fail uh, at a higher rate uh, in the early stages. You've got an idea, you don't know if it's valid, uh, you're going out to try and see if the technology is going to work, uh, and you assume that at that point a lot, there's a lot of mortality in the ideas. Uh, and what you actually find is that the failure rate is almost identical across the different rounds of financing. Uh, and so you know, the reasons why companies fail at the beginning often has to do with the lack of a product market fit. You've got an idea, people don't want to buy it, they don't want to pay for it, um, you can't get a team together. All of those things come together to, to create a set of failures. Uh, but then what happens is you have a company, it's going along, you get a series B, a series C. Um, and the, the big challenge is that everything you have to do um, changes. So you move from being um, a company that's exploring, a company where people do everything at the same time, you're a company of generalists, to one which starts to look like a machine. Uh, and as you do that, the basic mindset of what it takes changes quite a bit. Uh, and very few entrepreneurs are able to make that shift, uh, and very few boards are willing to, to, to go back in. And so the, the success rate or the failure rate in both cases is approximately 75%. Um, so of the companies that get funded, approximately 75% fail in stage one, another 75% fail in phase, in, in phase two. Um, and the cost of failure is quite different across um, India, Europe, Japan, the US. So one of the big differences that at least we've seen in, in our work here is that uh, one of the reasons why the US has such a vibrant economy, uh, a vi vibrant entrepreneurial culture, uh, is because failure is not that expensive. Um, that you can fail and, then, and just move on and treat that as a badge of experience. So let's start with um, <clears throat> Rajesh, if you could just start uh, with a quick introduction of your experience, and then talk about the, the um, just a couple of observations on the first phase. Right. So let me, uh, I'll come to myself later, but let me define the innovation challenge in India. So here is a system um, where the best educational institutes only produce talent. I'm talking about IITs. They produce no research, hardly any research. It is a system where uh, entrepreneurs don't want to fail. They continue to run subscale companies. It is a system where VCs don't take risks. They only fund clones. And finally, we have very large companies who always bottom fish. They don't pay for the talent. So how do you get innovation going in such a system, especially in the startup economy? That's the challenge that GSF is dealing with. I don't think we are in the business of accelerating the companies. I think we are in the business of accelerating serendipity. And the only way to do it is to spur innovation. And the many things I talk about it, but one thing that you talked about, especially in the tech world, my vision is how to make the cost of failure zero so that we have infinite experimentations Hopefully, some of our founders have the courage to think big and create large-scale, world-scale companies. So that's what we're trying to do at GSF. We do three different things. Uh, one, we run an acceleration program 
for founders who want to change the world uh, and have an idea which is unique and differentiated. And we run it at scale. Our first iteration with 115 companies and we run it in Delhi, Bombay, Bangalore. This, in our second iteration, we're going to Chennai. And with our third iteration, we'll also go to Hyderabad and hopefully to three to five other emerging world countries. Uh, the, the vision here is to create, uh, I hate to say it, but a tech star of emerging world. We also run a very large scale EIR program, which is our incubation program. In our first iteration, we brought in about 17 EIRs. One of them was School Geek, and uh, one of them was Serial Entrepreneur, but mostly people like you uh, who need to come back to India to find a vehicle to fulfill their dreams. Uh, and they have it right first check for them. Our vision there is to, uh, in fact, I got to know later after running the program that we had more EIRs than all VC community put together in India and perhaps the largest EIR program in the world. Uh, we are expanding the vision of that program to make it global and we want to attract at least half of our EIRs should be international from different parts of the world so that when they interact with Indian EIRs and the talent in India, they can create a new lexicon, a new kind of a company where the best of the West meets the best of the East. So that's our search. It's not complete. The other thing that I do is, uh, I've done it twice now, I run a very large conference where the best of Indian startups meet. In my last conference, 500 investors. We did it in Delhi and we're expanding that. It's sort of TechCrunch Disrupt if you've been there, SXSW. And third part of GSF is uh, a funding platform, uh, what is called Super Angels. And there are 20 leading tech digital founders who contribute a bit of capital, but a lot of mind share to help fuel the dreams of young Indians. So we funded about 20 companies so far. At GSF, I am obsessed about the idea of attracting the best talent and to the idea that we should always remain a startup. So our whole brand is about being a perpetual startup. When we're not working, we collapse to two, three people. When we're working, we become 100, 200 person organization. There's no employee in our company. Everyone is a partner. Uh, personally, about myself, this is my fourth big challenge in life, uh, the most significant one. In early 90s, I built private FM radio in India. Late 90s, I obsessed about the internet and built DIL in India Times, which became, in 2005, a very large, successful company and attracted $50 million from Chicoya uh, as Square's first entry into <coughs> India. Uh, last seven years, I obsessed about building a very large-scale entertainment company in India for Reliance, and we built half a billion dollar business for uh, Anil uh, I think at the GSF, I have the most significant opportunity facing India, that is to unleash innovation and creativity. Thank you. Hi, my name is Raj Yarasi, and I'm really here representing Mumbai Angels uh, as a sponsor of the event. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about my background and uh, save myself for the Q&A. I was uh, actually born and raised in the U.S., uh, went to college across the river here, and uh, worked at a couple, uh, I actually come from a public markets perspective, I worked at a couple of investment funds, hedge funds, if you will, in New York, and then back in 2004, just wanted to do something different, and uh, also had a fascination with India, of course, with my parents that I from, and uh, moved, found an opportunity, moved over there, and worked at a hedge fund um, in Bombay, investing in publicly traded companies, uh, small caps, mid caps, large caps, across industries. Uh, for uh, until kind of the end of 2007, beginning of 2008, and then I thought everything was a bit overvalued at that point in time. Anyhow, I had other interests in life as well, and uh, took a break and uh, produced a new film, actually, um, <laughs> starring Nasser and Shah, so that was a pleasure working with him. Um, and that was actually a good year not to be in the public markets. <laughs> 2008 was quite an adventure. Um, anyhow, we released the film and did what it did in early 2009, and then I joined Mumbai Angels and just started investing my own uh, in a few private companies. Uh, uh, I had a, uh, I guess I would characterize it as the good misfortune of, of uh, 
jumping into one of them and, and helping to run it just sort of turned into a turnaround situation. That certainly wasn't the plan when I invested, but uh, it was just going through a you know a critical growth phase and things weren't working the way we wanted it to, and I was representing the bike going forward, so I jumped in there and actually got operational for a couple of years. And thankfully now that the company's doing well. I moved back to the U.S. Uh, about a year ago with my now wife, and uh, I'm back in the public markets actually investing in a small fund in more U.S. micro caps, so closer to home. Uh, but I'm just here to share whatever insights I might have. I think my background is more, I, I could, maybe I could translate some of these experiences for people who are, you know, I don't know, I, I grew up in the U.S. and are considering going to India. That might be where I might actually add some value to the, uh, to the discussion here. But anyhow, I'll just uh, I'll draw my experiences during the Q&A, however I can. So my background is, uh, so I came to this country, uh, it's actually going to be my 20th year. And I was very fortunate to land in Silicon Valley, and I stayed there ever since. Um, well, a couple <coughs> of jobs, including KPMG, and I always had this desire to build my own company, my entire time in the business. And I started my first company in 2001, post bubble. Uh, I was very fortunate. We raised funding within like 40 days of switching to the North Coast. Uh, I thought that was a genius. And uh, we a built a supply chain software company called Valero with $24.5 million raised with a bunch of other investors. Valero wasn't a great exit because uh, at the end of our fourth and a half year, we were in a market where enterprise software was uh, a very hard market to play at. There was a lot of consolidation happening. And Rayleigh, who used to sit on my board, said, time to sell. So we had to sell. So in a nutshell, I made some money. It wasn't anything I was ecstatic about. And I literally, uh, I frankly did not make money for my common stockholders, which is my employees. I was running engineering at that time. Um, and being foolishly optimistic that I am, and in fact, if you want to be an entrepreneur, that's one thing you need to have, I uh, decided to do another company. And uh, when I started this company, which is Ignite, to be very honest with you, I had no idea that I'm building something related to the cloud. In fact, the product was an on-demand file server. And of course, since then, we changed the name on-demand, went out, cloud came in. Uh, but two things that I was very clear on on day one was, I look at the world, either you're going after the consumer or you're going after the enterprise. You're a dog or a cat, nothing in the middle. You may have a pathway through what people, people call as SMB, but really you're building an enterprise solution or a consumer play. And uh, we basically are in a situation today where there's a lot of serendipity in where we are. Uh, uh, this is a space which is getting faster than I ever anticipated. I am not the visionary types, I'm an execution guy. And to actually uh, correlate to what the professor was saying, uh, we have 160 employees. I've raised uh, only $33 million in Silicon Valley speak 33 is like, wow, you haven't raised much. Uh, the last one came from Google. The one prior to that was trying to fund it again. Mike Maples from Floodgate, Polaris, based in Walton. Um, and we are currently 30 plus thousand business accounts, three data centers, nine petabytes of data, all good stuff. But the biggest fear I really have is keep on scaling this company. And right now, I, I'm being completely honest with you guys, uh, you know, people or uh, the VCs or the press will ask you this right question, what keeps you up at night? Lately, I've been getting up at four and I don't go back to bed because my biggest fear is demand is coming. Our customers are getting larger. We're deploying seeds, uh, uh, accounts where 50,000 seeds, uh, 10,000 seeds, not five or 10 or some small, big stuff. Uh, and I constantly look at, keep on calibrating to say, do I have the right team? Do I have the right processes? As Professor said, the things used to work where somebody could be a generalist, it doesn't work anymore. So the biggest focus for me right now is constantly reinventing or rebuilding the team. People is the most important asset we have. Uh, and of course, technology is a big part of it. Uh, and see in the next 24 months, can I make this to be doing trailing revenues of $100 million? And that's currently the trajectory we are on. Hi, I'm Bapu. Uh, I'm a completely accidental entrepreneur. <laughs> I wanted to retire in my in the company where I started my career, which was the Dakaras. But 10 or 12 years ago, I had an epiphany which was that I wanted to be a golfer. 
so I decided to build a small hotel because I was in the hotel business there. And because I, it was a completely accidental decision, uh, I went into what was the worst space because for uh, first time, first generation entrepreneur, you don't get into a very capital intensive business, which is fundamentally in the space of crony capitalism. Okay, and what do I mean by crony capitalism? Which is something those of you who come to India will have to be careful about. Is there are businesses. Uh, which where people have asymmetric access to capital, okay, or asymmetric access to information or to influence, and you cannot easily compete with these people. Uh, because I didn't know better, I got into such a business, I had to create an entirely different business model to succeed. Uh, so that was to create asymmetric access to ideas, to talent, and to execution. Uh, I have raised about $400 million. I've sold 35% of my company. We have about 3,000 employees. We are very fast growing. Uh, but I have mostly India experience. Um, we've now started a small company in New York. So I have some experience about how it is to start a company here. Yeah. I'm also a, well, a private equity investor in three other companies, uh, which I have funded because these are opportunities that I've discovered along the way. Uh, what I've learned, my 10 years as an entrepreneur, I still want to retire by the way, is uh, that India is the wild west today. If you know how to get, you know, even a niche market in India is a mass market in any other part of the world. And if you know how to work the system, and I don't mean this in a, I'm not talking you know, ethics, I'm just saying if you know the market, you understand what you want to do. Um, those of you who read Outlier, the next 10 years is going to be the most exciting years for any entrepreneur, and that will be the So, <clears throat> now that we've got a quick introduction, I thought what might be useful, I'm just watching the time, we just go through one more round of panelists speaking and then open it up for questions. But um, if you could think about the one or two things, um, most of the audience here are aspiring entrepreneurs, either here or in India, but one or two things that in the, in the experience that you've had, uh, you would tell people either from India or from here, these are the things that, that I've learned that I would advise you to be careful of or to, to hit the accelerator on. What would they be? Let's just start on that end. I think the most important thing I've learned is that um, you've got to be, if you start a business, you've got to be very clear on the culture you want and uh, what you want that company to stand for. Now, it's true that your vision will grow every year. By the way, every year, you will climb, it's like climbing a flight of stairs. If you achieve what you want to, if you're fortunate enough not to get into a crisis at an early stage, because you will get into crisis, that's besides the point, but at an early stage, if you manage to you know, set your business model right, then what I have at least personally, I have now about 3,000 employees, we go about 50% a year, so we've grown very fast. But what I'm most interested in, uh, and I call myself, is the head of human resources or the head of people in my company. Because mine, as I said, is a very service-oriented business. I guess it's true for any technology company too. Uh, so people is the first thing I focus on. Uh, the second thing I've learned is pricing risk. Okay, uh, I didn't know enough earlier, but I realized that if you want to be reasonably successful as an entrepreneur, you must be able to enjoy risk. And the only way you can enjoy risk without hurting yourself is if you can price it right. So you need to understand risk very well. And the third is reputation. So I have a long-term view on my business, which uh, I think I briefly discussed with Shikha, that uh, I find that there are three types of scaling that is happening in business in India. One is people who want to scale to create value to exit, okay? The second is scaling opportunity. You get an opportunity, you grab it. And the third is what I think is very really value creating scaling, which is scaling on a long-term vision. And uh, uh, I'm very focused on the third. And to do that successfully, I'm very focused on the reputation of, of my company, especially in India as it is today. So when, um, when I'd done a company way back when, and we were looking at um, growing the business, at that time there was a a huge um, movement that the investment banks were already pushing, which was um, a movement called GBF, Get Big Fast. And very quickly, what people came back to was something called BSB, which was Big Shitty Business, 
um, <laughs> at the end that you ended up with a business model that didn't work. So, Vineet, when, when you look at growing the business as fast as you're growing, how do you manage to keep the, the people and the business model consistent? You know, uh, borrowing a couple of things uh, that Paru said, uh, I very seriously and sincerely believe that when it comes to hiring people at whatever level, whether it's exact or mid-level or entry level, skills are definitely important. But lately, I actually have a rule book, I mean, it's not written anywhere, it's more in my head, that 51% of the decision making of you will be hired and added to my team is your integrity and 49% is your skill, because skills you acquire. But integrity is so important for me, uh, because I'm in a startup, and things will go all right, or there'll be some challenges always, and I also don't want to build a company based on consensus decision making because that's the uh, race to mediocrity. So there will be differences of opinion. But if you and I trust each other, whoever's right, we will make that decision and we'll go in that direction. That is absolutely number one for me. And then the number two thing which we look for, and you know, we are in a still a relatively early stage, is I really ask, and I've asked it to my, I recently hired a CMO, like what's a fire in your belly? And people are like, what do you mean? What's a fire in your belly? What's the hunger? What's driving you? And that is an absolutely important question to say, what drives these people? And does their value system align with mine? It doesn't mean I'm right or they're wrong. Does it align with mine? Because I'm building this company, and I want to be with people who have the same hunger and the same desire to success. And the third and the most important thing is people ask me, so what's your exit strategy? I'm like, contact me. How many options do you have? You die, you'll get acquired, you go public. Right? <laughs> and I don't want to die. Um, going public, yeah, lately, you know, I've seen uh, silly stuff happen where people have gone public. Uh, I will not name them. Uh, but I really think, ser seriously, you have to build for the long term. You have to think, how do I make a big business? To give you a very um, uh, honest uh, outlook into how I think. Two weeks back, I was having a dinner with the CEO of a public company in San Francisco. For our dinner, the guy made an offer on the table to buy the company. And I, this is my second one in the last two years. And I said, I'm flattered, I really appreciate it, it's nice to be loved by people, but I'm not interested in selling. Why? Because the deal was being structured where the founders and some of the senior execs, and obviously I, would have made good money with two earn outs, the rest of the common would get 0.7 on every dollar, and the preferred would be in a such a screwy fashion that they would not make the entire money, and despite us not having any funky liquidation preferences. And I said, I don't play that way. Life is too short, you've got to be honest, and you need to create value for your employees, number one, your customers, and your partners, for the people who have given me money to build the company. So therefore, my third point is, Always think how do you make it for the long term. And things will happen. I mean, tomorrow I get an offer on the table, which is interesting enough. I'm sure I'll be pragmatic and look at it. But don't look for short term. That's my honest uh, answer. So just, you know, um, one of the persistent lessons for having been around the entrepreneurial world for a long time is that at any point you can make decisions and those decisions might be optimized for that particular set of circumstances. But in almost every experience I've had, the, the world is actually very, very small. And so when you do something that hurts some of your constituencies, you find that it just comes back. And sometimes very directly, it comes back to you in all kinds of different ways. Because in some ways, entering the entrepreneurial world, you're entering a world that's very rarefied. And people know each other, and after a while, you bump into each other. Uh, and so that's pretty great advice. Raj? Uh, <coughs> Yeah, although it's, it's uh, I will say it's, it's amazing how many people get away with murder. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's just flattery ass me, but. Um, yeah, but in, in the Indian context, you next life you're going to get. Unless you get moksha. Yeah, I, I was, I, you know, I, I, I don't have much yawn to give. I would just, um, you know, to to Vinit's point, I think it's very important. Um, looking at having looked at things on the as an on the investment side as an angel investor, that the people you invest with really 
have what it takes to stay focused because there are just so many adversities and ups and downs and distractions, I think, when you're building a business. And uh, oftentimes, um, you know, the people you're investing with are highly qualified in other ways and that provides exit options. You know, uh, exit options not in a good sense, but distractions, I guess. You know, people sometimes want to pull the ripcord. And how do you really know that they're going to stick with it through thick and thin? I, I think it's tough. It's tough to really judge that because you can ask people and they'll Tell, you know, they'll say all the right things, but uh, perhaps if it's close to their background and it's, it's, it's evidently close to home, uh, I invested in a couple companies, one of which is a, uh, now the leading car playing site in India, it's Rummy. <coughs> play for points, you can play for cash. Um, and the, the fellow who started it was a IIT Bombay fellow who then was getting, a, got his PhD at NYU and here in, in New York, and uh, he paid his way through grad school by playing professional poker at night on, online, not professional, sorry, playing online on the, on the sites, um, actually you know, made enough to make a living. Uh, and then decided, you know, uh, I want to go back to India and start a company and found this sort of exemption in the Indian Public Gambling Act that games of skill are exempt and Rummy happens to be considered a game of skill so far. Um, you know, so like that sort of fact pattern as an investor is helpful. And, and, uh, you know, and watching him start it, uh, I didn't come in on the first round, I came in a little bit later, and seeing how he dealt with it. I think there's no substitute for that. Um, another company I invested in was uh, a different situation, which I think is quite common, um, where the fellow who started it, it's, a, it's, it's the company I had to jump into to, to help run for a bit, pharmaceutical market research company, uh, getting data from uh, pharmaceutical distributors across India and aggregating it and selling it back to big pharma on a subscription basis. The fellow who started it worked, grew up in the, the Indian pharma industry and worked in sales and marketing for big pharma. So you knew that. He had no other life, <laughs> so so um, I, I I think I've seen a lot of people, um, you know, who really want to be an entrepreneur badly, but maybe they don't come from a certain domain or they don't, you know, they they, they latch onto something maybe a little bit early um, that they really don't have a fascination with that keeps them in it for the long haul. Um, so as an investor, I've just noticed that the people in the former camp tend to succeed. Right. So this is what I learned. It takes the same effort to build a small business and perhaps even lesser effort to build a big business. <coughs> Think about it. Everyone is working hard, whether it's a pawn shop wala or a restaurant guy. So you might as well work for something that is big. Uh, and that's the insight I gather. You might as well impact a large number of people. You might as well change the world, and it's all here, and it's all the same effort. So that's the first thing I learned. And when you're thinking of something big, either through serendipity or through a plan, uh, have the best people with you, right? And don't compromise. Pay the price. And pay the price in terms of salaries, be it, and it's even better to make them partners. Share the wealth with them, and that's what I think he referred to. And I think that's where we have the biggest challenge in India, to carry our people with us and make them partners. And the third thing that I notice, especially from where I come in, we don't fucking give up. You know, we need to quit often and quit early. We waste so much of our time chasing certain dreams and ideas. And in certain cases, we need to realize the market realities and move on to new ideas. And that gives you new energy. It renews the whole system. You have to let the capitalism work. Uh, and if you don't do that, you keep running suboptimal organizations. You're also unhappy, struggling with life. I think that's, if we start to do that, and I learned this lesson from the professor here itself, Deepak Mandhotra, who talked to you guys last year. Uh, quit early, quit often. These are the three things I've learned in my life. So I had a, <coughs> a student from here a couple of years ago who did an independent project and his idea was to combine Facebook and um, uh, YouTube. And so the idea was every computer has a, has a camera in it and so what he was going to take, do was take professionals and have them run video so lessons of different, different sorts and create a network. And he had this huge plan and the name of the company was Webcam Generations. And so after he graduated, I put a tiny bit of money in, was an advisor to the company 
didn't give them too much advice, but for the time I used to get these quarterly updates. And um, one quarter I suddenly noticed that the name of the company, his email address had changed from webcam generations to Adore Me. And I thought that's quite a shift. Uh, going back to the idea of if something's not working, what do you do? So I called him up and I said, what's your business model? How come you change your name of the company from webcam generations to Adore Me? It turned out he'd gone into the lingerie business. So I'm an investor in a lingerie company. <laughs> Clearly his, his energy went up. <laughs> so let's um, switch back to questions. And um, we have a panel open. You can either ask a question to uh, anyone on the panel, or you can um, or just ask it generally to the, to the panel. So, Traditionally, we've seen Do you guys want to come here and ask questions? Yeah, actually, what do we just say there? Just, just ask the question. Okay. Okay. So, one of the ways that we've seen traditionally in India how the traditional businesses have expanded is through diversification. So you build, a, expand across different verticals. And, uh, and you know, we've seen sort of that returning, the conglomerate culture, which was sort of despised by the rest of the world, is the world sort of looks at it, looks, okay, there's something in it. Do you see uh, your companies uh, or even startups, uh, you know, expansion through sort of vertical, uh, you know, expansion as a way of uh, scaling up uh, yeah. if you reach a sort of sat saturation level? Can I attempt an answer to this? Okay. Go to any Indian town, small town, you will meet this businessman, and you always write chairman, some group of companies, right? And you're pro. What does it do? going to have a, a IT outsourcing company, we run a real estate business, we probably also have a restaurant, and some other stuff that his wife does. <laughs> and I think it's a very deep-rooted issue, and it has come into our system because we have not learned to create globally scalable vertical businesses. So then what we do is, within our immediate surrounding, to get the growth going, we start getting into these kind of situations for ourselves. And I think that's what you leverage it. And there is an incentive to do that at even large conglomerate levels because the way the government rewards influence and you know gives spectrum and so many things still are like government control. But I think the true verticalization today in this world will happen when you go global. Right? Even beyond the Indian market. Right? And that's the paradigm shift that Indian business people and entrepreneurs need to have. And that's what I'm trying to encourage my startups uh, to believe that they can go global. Right? And it all starts from one success. And I recall this interaction, and I'm he's an investor into our setup. He's from HBS. His name is Naveen Tiwari. This boy built, and he's funded by Mumbai Angel. And we built this business called Inmobi, which is world's now second largest, if not the largest, uh, ad platform. And he was very clear from day one when I met him, and these guys sent me to counsel him because he was scaling price. And uh, I spoke to him at one conference. He said, what's the plan? He said, my plan is to be big. That's the only plan I want to build a global business. We need to have a lot, many more of Naveen Tiwari's. Build that belief that we can build globally scalable vertical business out of India. I think that's the challenge. Yeah, both, both the companies are still involved with that I mentioned. Yeah, we're just focused on our current business. And we have some product line extensions that we're working on in both in the online gaming space. We're looking at you know, uh, a social game, a Facebook version, or a mobile version, but fundamentally still running. I think in the business plan initially, we were thinking of uh, other games. And in fact, they, uh, when they first started, they launched uh, two games, Rami and Chess. And then they, they realized that people were gaming the there were, uh, some people were consistently winning on chess, and they realized that what they were doing was they were finding opponents and then getting a computer chess move, uh, chess machine and, and playing their opponent's move on the chess machine <laughs> and taking the computer's move and playing it so they were winning every time. So they rapidly scrapped that. And then since then, uh, the, you know, the, the growth has been such and the challenges have been such that they've just been focused so on running. Uh, on the pharma side, we have a few complementary products, but it's uh, very clearly an industry-focused uh, company. I think in the startup world, uh, in, in areas that are very competitive and dynamic, it's, it's tough to really venture too far afield, in my opinion. Okay. Question? Yeah. Uh, I 
Russian or Dalit, uh, you know, uh, one Russian or Dalit. Uh, there's, a, there's no shortage of great education institutes and um, companies in India. So when you are evaluating talent, what, what value do you place? How do you compare uh, people who have been educated, who been educated in the West or who worked in companies in the West? How do you think about them compared to people who've grown and been educated in the West? I think uh, point of reference is to talent in India, right? I don't think I can answer that. You want me to answer? <laughs> oh. <clears throat> so, you, so one is the skills. You hire for skills. So you want to evaluate a person on skills, whether Indian or non-Indian, doesn't matter. But in the business I'm in, which is startups, you need three people. You need a hustler, right? Who can get the work done. And you need uh, a geek, the tech guy, who will build the product. Right? And then you need a product person or a design person who has the creativity to create consumer delight. Right? These are the three key things that I look for. And this is where we have the biggest deficit, perhaps in the world and more so in India, is in the product and the design people. You don't have enough creative people right, to get the consumer insights, who have the ability to connect, the ability to think the whole interaction cycle. And perhaps you would go with me to believe that that's a global deficit. Uh, I'm looking for those people and I want to bring those people to India from wherever they are in the world. <coughs> now the other thing is about attitude, right? Uh, especially where I come from, when I look for inducting uh, startups into our accelerator program, uh, we're looking for exceptionally motivated people People with our dream, hopefully during the daytime with their eyes open, <laughs> uh, and uh, passion, right? A certain attitude to get it done. And we are fine if they fail. In fact, I encourage a lot of people to shut it down and start again, right? Uh, so attitude is very important. And we, I now I've decided I only want to deal with people who want to change the world. Uh, for myself, it's not worth my time to just be talking to people who will give me 1x, 2x, 3x returns. I only want to talk to people who want to give me 1,000, 10,000x return, and I'm fine failing in that debt. That's my personal view. So Raj, you, you moved to India from here and have experience on both sides. <coughs> you know, coming from this perspective and operating in India, what was the, what was the did you have a, a shift that you had to go through? Um, <coughs> Yeah, I guess, I guess the biggest challenge um, for someone coming from here um, was basically the, the mouthpiece of the corruption um, element. Uh, you, know, you see it investing in the public markets, and then you come face to face with it when you're actually investing in private, private companies. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that makes it difficult. I think, uh, you know, you got to be really careful who you trust, especially your own employees, because you know you're more vulnerable to them uh, in many ways. Um, you know, we had all kinds of issues with the pharma data business, where we discovered all kinds of fraud in the field. Um, you know, we had a field force of, of 200 people who were working on a company not escorted in the field without without tight monitoring and enforcement and verification mechanisms to make sure they're doing their job. They, so that to me was really continually eye-opening throughout the seven, eight years I was there. And uh, dealing with that, I think, is, uh, is a cost of doing business. Um, question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Rajesh. Uh, I have been working with the two-way group, and I've heard you back uh, with the Mr. Alok Ketri, one of those I've worked with a lot of startups and launched their business in India. My question to uh, full the entire panel is here. Uh, how do you find the cultural fit while you go out and seek investors? Because at a certain point of time, we have seen certain examples and <coughs> investors say, hey, this company, big company came in for investment, but we never invested because we thought it would be a fail. So uh, how do you, how uh, like a company or you know, a startup wants to seek that cultural fit within the investment itself, or within the investment? You're talking in India? Yeah. See, I have three ministers. <clears throat> and what I see, I think uh, 
different businesses have different kinds of investor needs. Okay. Uh, so while I agree, I'm going to talk to talk it for a moment like what Rajesh said. Makes a lot of sense. Think global, go global for an IT business. For a traditional business, you want to be the best in class and the biggest and best in your own market. Because before you go global, you better be strong in your own market. Okay. So similarly, in, in a traditional business like mine, I want a patient investor. Because if, if a business is a commodity business or a cyclical business, you want an investor who is there with you so that he can time his exit. You don't plan to exit, but he should be able to time his exit. So the, my first investor was Boba Papers, okay? So in 2006, they bought a uh, uh, minority stake for about $70 million. They have to exit in seven years, so in 2013, by this time I think we'll go public, they will exit you know, in the next one year. The second was a bank, Shinsai Bank, okay? Uh, these guys are there for the long time. The third was a realty fund. And all these are small stakes, 2%, 3%. This guy is there for seven years. But what I was looking for happened six months ago when I raised a, a very large sum of money with the government of Netherlands, okay, which is a pension fund. Now, the pension fund is interested. That's where you get a line. What is the pension fund looking for? Yield, because it's getting capital on a long-term basis and is looking over a 30-year period. Because they're, you, know, you are putting your pension money aside and they have to plan to return it to you after 30 years. Let's assume. So these guys want to be with you for 10 to 20 to 30 years, which is perfect for my business because my business is asset creation and uh, you know uh, you have to time your exit from the asset side. So the first is an alignment of, 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 uh, of uh, timelines. The second is your personal fit to the person. So this, this pension fund, which, which is the pension fund of the government of Netherlands, of, of Netherlands uh, I met the CEO, he came down to India because they were, this was their first investment in India and it was, you know, $300 million with me alone. He came and spent time with me, I met him. They were very worried, like Raj was just telling you about what happens in India. And finally, um, you know, after there was enough comfort and that's very chemical, okay, uh, he invested. Uh, so that's my kind of business. Now, uh, I guess you folks will know better. I just want to comment on that. I think <coughs> it's, uh, Absolutely right. So first is the personal comfort. Between the investor and the founders, you need to be able to talk, especially in early stage. Right? If, if I find, as an investor, I cannot talk to the person, he doesn't get my language, there's no point being a partner with him. And you should evaluate the same. Is your investor able to talk to you in your language? Does he understand your language? Then the other thing is, which is very appropriate to the life cycle of the company, when you are an angel sort of a company, very early stage, there's no point bringing a VC on. When you are at growth stage, you need to bring a venture capitalist on. When you are at later high growth stage, perhaps private equity kind of people. So you have to find the right fit. Uh, because at each life cycle stage, the kind of investor you bring has a different kind of expectation of staying with your company. And of course, everyone desires patient capital, but capital by nature is impatient. <coughs> We have to understand that reality and therefore get that fit right. Uh, and then there are many other nuances regarding, especially early stage, you want to also have people who can help you build businesses, open some doors for you, help you, give you some strategic advice, including telling you to shut up or shut down, right? And you need to therefore be having people who get it. So it's almost your job, and it's the most important job that you constitute your early investor group in the right sort of way. And I think that comes from smart smart founders have intuitive sense of what that right thing is. So really if you've dealt with some of the some of the largest names in in um, venture funding, how did you choose between the four or five different people who would be interested in your company? It's always uh, based on the situation. Sometimes you have the luxury of choosing. Sometimes you don't have that much of a luxury because you want to raise money. But uh, I've been quite fortunate, so uh, I actually, uh, in my last round, uh, Series C that I was doing, um, I had three term sheets in front of me, and uh, I had one from the guys next door, uh, Google. We are actually literally in the Google Plex area. And I was looking at uh, multiple factors. I already had a marquee named VC 
to whatever extent, like kind of Perkins involved, I have my thinkers. And the thing I was looking for to say, other than money, I mean, you can always get the money. And sometimes it's actually great to get the money, uh, depending on the situation your company or the growth stage you're in. But I was looking for to say, if I give them a board seat, what stuff do I get on the table in my board which will help me individually as the CEO better? So the thing I always look for, number one, is the person that I'm taking money from, not the firm, but the person who's going to join my board as either a board member, observer, or whatever right you want to give them, what do they bring to the table based on real operational experience? Because I have seen, with no disrespect, VCs went to Yale, went to Harvard, became an associate, became a partner. What the hell will you tell me about building a company? You haven't built a company ever before. There's nothing wrong with it, but I want people who have built companies, have had operational experience. So one is that. The second thing, as you pointed out, is the chemistry. Do I want to work with this person for the next three to four years? And thirdly, it's mechanics. If I'm taking money from their fund, which fund is it? What stage that fund is in? What kind of IRR? This is only returned based on successful exits. And therefore, what pressure will they put on me to say, I need exit in two versus four years? So it's kind of a combination of things that I would look for. So for those of you who are still in the RC, pay attention to your 10 class. These are all things that, that we, we go through in the, in the cases. Um, other questions? Go ahead. more related to the potential um, corruption aspect that you had mentioned, Raj. So if you're going into, let's say you want to start something in a new field that does have a lot of corruption that consumers are aware of and such, they're already wary of the field, how do you do that? How do you go about making an impact that you want to have and that you know should be there? Uh, I'm sorry, can you give me an example of, of a field? Well, that I mean, like, um, in reference to potentially like other countries, um, if you're talking about, like, in my particular instance, um, it's the nonprofit world. Um, so there's, in any country, there's, like, where it is, is your money really going, where it should be going, and such. So is that enough of an example, or? And you're, uh, yeah, no, I, I think it makes sense. But what, what, what would you want me to address about that? I guess, how do you go about still making an impact and still, like, being present in the field and starting the change that should be there. So how do you initiate that and keep it going and get people to start trusting you and changing that that market, I guess? Okay, as someone starting a nonprofit. Yes. Right yeah, so you're much smaller at the time. Right. And I'm not terribly familiar with the nonprofit world, but so I'll just go on with you know, what I do now. But, um, <clears throat> I think, uh, I would imagine that, you know, everyone here probably would have as well that um, you know I guess running it is part of the part of the challenge but not all of it you know to, since you're, you're dependent on on getting the donations and, uh, you know so you have to convince those people and in some ways um, the people who support you can also be that imprimatur that you are well run you have good people and you're uh, you know you have the right control mechanisms as you're tracking tracking mechanisms to make sure that the money is not being siphoned out you know so I know the Gates Foundation is really big on they insist on certain protocols whenever they invest in a company. <coughs> so I, I guess it's a combination of those two, getting uh, the right sponsorship, whether it's advisors who have good reputations, of course, they're going to have to trust you, not just in your own personal ethics, but in your ability to run an organization to you know, minimize, let's say, the malfeasance that might occur at lower levels. Um, yeah, I, I think if you could pull that off, then you know, that would probably, probably help. There definitely are a lot of people doing great work uh, in a lot of these countries. And, you know, many of them are doing it in a way that minimizes, you know, that wastage. Can I make a comment? Yeah. So India probably has the largest number of NGOs in the world. You know that, right? And 90% of them are frauds. You also know that. Because they're doing politicians and bureaucrats, and in many cases the money is siphoned and it never reaches the final beneficiaries. Having said that, if uh, 10% of the genuine, and most of them are doing hugely transformative work, especially in the field of education, rural healthcare. And if you're really genuine about making an impact in India, you should do a lot of diligence. And if you do diligence, you'll find out who the good people are. Uh, and 
that's the only advice I have. Thank you for your powerful insights this afternoon. As a native Indian but an American citizen, I'm surprised at how many connections there are in terms of the issues that we face. Right? Both uh, countries face issues of educational technology, effective technological infrastructure, etc. Are there powerful impact um, exemplars of companies that have supported efforts in, or are need in India, but also met a need in the United States through collaborative efforts or through some type of business venture? So, Actually, when you say they've addressed the need, what need are you referring to? Is it economic need? Because, yeah, I mean, the need I can give you examples of companies, are companies which have done it in both places, but can you be more specific? Sure. I feel like your company is one of them, that regardless of where you are, you can address uh, a need that somebody might have. But, for instance, in educational technology, right, we have a, such a need to have blended learning models. Um, are there exemplars of companies who've done successful blended models in India and in the U.S.? I have some ideas. <laughs> so, in, in I think uh, my, my personal sense is the, uh, the, especially on the education models, India is such a layered uh, country. Uh, there is a part of India where the needs are perhaps same as you find here. <coughs> But there's a huge swath of population uh, where the challenges are entirely different. So I think personally in education, the biggest challenge in India is lack of teachers. We don't have teachers, right? And I'm working with someone to solve that problem where we say, can we create a platform where people volunteer time to go in the rural places, uh, spend three months, six months, and maybe Americans, maybe people from across the world come and and they want to contribute to the humanity, right? And how do we leverage technology to be able to do that? I'm very keen to solve, personally. We're working through technology to solve that problem, create a platform where people can give time to the poor uh, uh, rural places. The biggest problem we have, according to me, is the lack of <coughs> qualified teacher with motivations to stay in rural economy. So one last question. My question is uh, specifically for Patu. Uh, you're one of the very few people who has created an asset-heavy business from scratch. And as entrepreneurs, uh, when we look at business ideas, we are often told to look at asset-like businesses that we can scale up fast. So, and if our ideas are around businesses which require uh, capital and require heavy assets, how do we look at those businesses and how do we go about, go about overcoming those challenges? Now that I'm not an accidental entrepreneur, I can only recommend one thing, that is get into asset light, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Sachs, for example, I know the, the, this person, uh, and, 
uh, including one person from Reliance Hiller Prakash, and he got into fiber optic business because he being backed by a bunch of investors. So, if you are a senior executive who's built relationships and has a deep expertise and he's taking a leap into next generation, uh, there are there are private equity players who are willing to back you. And the, the, it's not uh, the end of the road there. But your shareholding is that much less. Yeah, that's right. So, so you really, really have to, uh, when you get into those kind of businesses, then you have 10, 20, 30 percent kind of shareholding. Not like. <coughs> so, <laughs> <quite good>. <laughs> <laughs> so, really quick, um, we're, we're almost out of time. Uh, we talked about non profit, we talked about the contrast. In India, we talked a little bit about corruption, we talked about creating something of great value. And one incident, instance that comes to mind that brings many of these themes together is there's an organization in India called Akshay Patra that does um, school lunch programs. I think now they're up to 1.2 million children a day that they feed. Uh, and so that's an organization that's at scale, that's doing amazing work, uh, and has been trying to follow the principles of uh, transparency and lack of corruption. But then when, the, when you go into India, when you actually go into the local areas, uh, you're always confronted with local officials, governments, and so on. And so in, in their case, they've brought the price of a meal down to about six rupees or so uh, per meal, which is far lower than the government can do. It turns out the government is required by the Supreme Court in India to do school, school lunch programs. Anyone who goes to school can get lunch there. And so the state gov the government had come to the organization and said, we have this obligation, our budget is two rupees, we obviously cannot get a meal done for that, so we will donate the grain for your, for your programs. Uh, except that they insisted that the organization buy everything at the government mandated price, and none of the local dealers would sell at the government mandated price because they could make no money on that. So then in a typical Indian way, they all reached sort of a compromise of the grain dealers did, and they decided to put stones into the rice so the weight would go up and they could make enough money. And so this organization then went back and said, obviously you can't cook with that, so they had technology. Um, so when the, when the grain would come in, they'd run it through a series of sifters um, and take out all the stone. Uh, and at the end, they had magnets that would take out the metal that was in there. Uh, and so this worked pretty well as a way of accommodating everything until one day the grain dealers found this out. They sent a delegation to the organization saying, we understand you have this technology that's taking out all the stones. It's really hard for us to get stones that look like grain. Everything works in its own way. Thank you very much.